Okay, my name is uh, Sam Thompson. I'm a professor here at Penn State Law. This is the introduction to class number 12 of the 14 classes offered in the spring semester of 2021 at Penn State Law in my course entitled The Lawyer's Role in Helping Close the Minority White Gap in Business Ownership. Background information on the course is given in the intro to the first session. The materials for each session, including slide presentations on the materials, are in the folder for the session on the Penn State Law website. This is the seventh um, class of classes 5 through 12, which principally focus on chapters in the business planning casebook by Professors Maynard, Warren, and Trevino. The purpose of the session is to give students the tools they need in advising any small business, uh, whether it be a minority or non-minority owned business. As, so, as shown on the syllabus for today's class, we are focusing on SBA financing issues, and our class leaders are Ethan W. Smith, managing partner of Starfield and Smith in Fort Washington, PA, and Cassandra Harvard, a professor at the University of Baltimore School of Law. The assigned student is Brittany Peterson. There will be some duplication with this introduction at the beginning of the class, including a more complete introduction of today's class leaders, Ethan and Cassandra. Let me alert you to a special session of this course that will meet on April 20 um, from 4 to 8.30. That session, which will be both live and recorded, We'll focus on perspectives from outstanding lawyers, economists, bankers, business school deans, venture capitalists, private equity investors, tax policy experts, and business entrepreneurs. So let's get started with today's program, and thanks for being here. Thank you so much to Ethan Smith for joining us today. And Ethan is the managing partner at Starfield and Smith in Fort Washington. Pennsylvania, where uh, he focuses on SBA financing issues. Uh, we have some other bio information in the materials on Ethan. And um, I just want to thank him so much for uh, agreeing to participate in this, uh, in this program. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it over to Brittany, who's been working with Ethan and Cassandra on um, this very important uh, topic. So, Brittany, you have it. All right, thanks, Professor. Um, I'll note, it appears Professor Haver just uh, joined in, so just so. Cassandra, are you there? I am here, finally. I couldn't find the email from Tim. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> well, thank, thank you so much for being here. Uh, so let me introduce, uh, Professor Harvard, she is uh, a professor at the University of Baltimore School of Law. Uh, she does, and she does, among other things, policy work dealing with SBA issues. She's written some uh, uh, an article on uh, the po some policy aspects of an SBA financing, and we are uh, very happy to have her here. And also, she and I have something very in common, and that is. We both are graduates of the University of Pennsylvania Law School, a little bit down the road in uh, Philadelphia. So Hold welcome, on. Cassandra. Thank you so much for having me, Sam. And I'm just going to still try to get my, my camera exactly where I want it. So forgive me for just a second as I put this iPad on a stand. OK. Um, as you're doing that, Professor, I will go ahead and start into the background of the SBA. Yeah. Um, so the SBA's website explains the history of the regulations um, leading up to the establishment of the SBA. So although the Small Business Act wasn't passed until 1953, um, their mission began much earlier. So in the Great Depression, obviously devastated the economy. Uh, the stock market lost 90% of its value between 1929 and 1932. Uh, to alleviate this financial crisis, President Hoover created the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, 
uh, which the website described as a federal lending program for all businesses hurt by the depression, large and small. Uh, and then this is known as the grandparent of the SBA. World War II then brought a huge change to the American economy. During the war, 17 million new jobs, civilian jobs were created, industrial productivity increased by 96%, and corporate profits doubled after taxes. Um, however, while large businesses were having a lot of success because they were ramping up production with large government contracts um, and the need for wartime defense contracts, small businesses were being left behind uh, with little chance of success. So to even this playing field, uh, Congress created the Smaller War Plants corporate, er, Corporation, which provided direct loans to private entrepreneurs, encouraged large financial institutions to make credit available to small entrepreneurs, and advocated small business interests to federal procurement agencies and big businesses. Post-war, obviously, this closed down. So much of the work and responsibilities that would eventually belong to the SBA were assumed by the small Office of Small Business, However, this mainly just focused on education outreach uh, as opposed to the practical um, help that the SBA would eventually offer. So later, President Eisenhower proposed the creation of the Small Business Agency, agency and in 53, Congress passed the Small Business Act, creating the administration. Its stated function is to aid, counsel, assist, and protect insofar as the interests of small business concerns. So the SBA is just as a practical matter. It's led by an administrator and deputy administrator who are all then confirmed by Senate. The regulations that apply, obviously the, small, the SBA Small Business Act that we talked about um, that just created the Small Business Administration um, in 53 and it's periodically reviewed by Congress. The Small Business Investment Act provides ways to invest in small business investments. Um, and then the code of federal regulations, obviously the formal rulemaking procedure, um, these formal rules will apply to the administrative agency and then standard operating procedures happen within the company. So they're more internal guidelines that just tell the SBA how to interpret their, or their own interpretations of the rules. Um, the stated mission of the SBA is that the United States Small Business Administration helps Americans start, build, and grow businesses. So they offer many programs to help businesses, including, as I said earlier, a lot of educational programs. So their website has a ton of video tutorials on anything from starting a business, uh, managing a business, and financing a business. They have tutorials as well as uh, actual handouts and videos, and even real guidance that you can call and ask. Uh, and among these programs offered, the loan guarantee program is the most important, especially for our discussion today. Um, so here, as listed on the FCA, SBA's website, the four most important roles they have is granting access to capital, entrepreneur development, government contracting, and also advocacy. We'll talk about that as we go through, um, but access to capital is obviously going to be how the SBA helps either provide loan or get access to loans for startup businesses. Entrepreneur de development is they're offering um, free counseling and government, I mean, business advice to startups. We already discussed government contracting and then advocacy is kind of outside of the scope of the presentation that we'll have today. Okay, so the SBA's primary, uh, three primary loan programs. The SBA works with lenders to provide loans to small businesses. So the SBA helps facilitate loans with third party lenders, um, so like banks or credit unions, by guaranteeing that a certain portion of the loan will be repaid in the 7A loan, sorry. Uh, the second loan is the 504 loans. So these are gonna be like long fixed rate financing financing. Here, the SBA again isn't actually providing, or it'll be, the funding will be coming from a CDC, which we'll learn later. And then lastly, it's going to be the microloans where the SBA is going to be providing, but those are going to be a lot smaller than the first two loans. Now, can I, can I interject here and ask a, a basic question? Of course. 
on your pri previous slide, if you go back to your previous slide, uh, the you where you talk about access to capital. Oh, sorry. Here. So yeah. So access to capital. You come down here, uh, and you say micro lending to sub to uh, substantial debt and equity investment. Substantial debt and equity investment. Where where where, where is the equity investment by the SBA. Ethan, if you want to go. Uh, I, yeah, okay. Well, I, I, I figured I'd give you the opportunity, oh. but uh, uh, yeah, so uh, the, the SBA has a program for equity investment. It's SBA's uh, version of venture capital. It's called the uh, uh, small, business, small Business Investment Company. Um, and again, it's it's I would say of the uh, of the loan programs, it is the most similar uh, in terms of its structure to the micro loan program. So for the 7A loan program, a bank is lending its capital out with a conditional guarantee from the SBA. In the 504 program, uh, it, it's a uh, uh, it's a partnership where the bank is making a loan and then an agent of the SBA comes sells bonds uh, to fund uh, a subordinate uh, lien uh, for long-term capital. Microloan and the SBIC program uh, both are uh, the closest thing to direct loan programs that the SBA has. But even then, they're not making the loans directly to the end user business. They're lending to a lender who then either invests or lends to the uh, end user uh, small business. So SBIC, the government will actually uh, make loans to these uh, uh, funds that end up looking very similar to venture capital funds who then will uh, uh, leverage that capital by investing in small businesses, oftentimes taking an equity piece uh, or some, uh, you know, some form of convertible uh, debt. Uh, and there are a variety of things that they can do. The microloan program, it's the same thing. The SBA makes a loan to a microloan intermediary that then deploys uh, that capital uh, in you know, very small loans uh, to uh, eligible uh, end user businesses. Okay. I may have some questions uh, as we move through on this small business investment company concept. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, then, before we get to those complicated questions, we'll start with the basic programs offered by the SBA, um, starting with the standard 7A loan. So this is by far the most popular and, and frequently known program offered by the SBA. It's the best option. Uh, it says for real estate, whenever real estate is part of a business pr purchase, but it can also be used for short and long-term working capital refinancing current business debt and purchasing furniture, fixture, and other supplies. Um, so as you can see here, the maximum loan amount is 5 million. Um, and then the key eligibility factors for who can actually get a loan are based on what the business does to receive its income, uh, its credit history, and where the business operates. So as I said, um, these are all the very specific eligibility requirements that limit who can actually apply for these 7A loans. And then here are all the different business needs or business uses that you're actually allowed. So the 7A loan, as we said, um, is by far the most popular option. Um, it's also available to be used for the most uses as opposed to the 504, which we'll get into next. Um, and Ethan, did you want to add anything onto the? Yeah, yeah. I, I you know, again, I, I, I don't want to steal your thunder here. So uh, the seven eight program is what's referred to as SBA's flagship loan program. Uh, you do have all the stats here. Actually, currently, uh, because of. Uh, uh, provisions of the Economic Aid Act that passed back at the end of December, uh, the maximum guarantee has been raised for 7A loans to a maximum of 90% uh, on an interim basis. Uh, the federal government is also subsidizing the guarantee fee 
that borrowers have to pay uh, in connection with these loans. And so it's, uh, uh, it, it's, a, it's a pretty attractive uh, product for small businesses right now. Uh, that combined with the fact that there are subsidized uh, loan payments uh, that are being made under the CARES Act, under the Economic Aid Act, and under the uh, Recovery Act, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's uh, uh, a very, uh, it's become a very inexpensive uh, source of, uh, of capital and financing uh, for businesses uh, right now. In, in terms of the eligibility, I, I think that there are a, a, a couple things that, that we should probably focus on because if you're uh, looking at possibly representing a business that wants to uh, uh, potentially access these programs, you need to know whether or not you're gonna be able to get through the door and access this financing. And some of it is, uh, uh, so we've got we've got some of the things on there, but before we even get into operating for you know profit, really the second bullet is uh, uh, you know in my mind one of the most important ones, which is you know the business has to be a small business, right? It's in the name of the agency. <laughs> so, uh, but but what does that mean? Um, and and there have been a lot of uh, I guess you know kind of misconceptions. You know when uh, the SBA, which has been talked about more in the last year in the media uh, than it has in my prior 20 years of practicing in this area. Uh, thank you, Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's, everyone has kind of, uh, you know, conceives of, you know, your typical uh, small business being, uh, you know, the corner bodega or the mom and pop pizza shop or, you know, you know some, uh, 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 craftsman, whether it's a carpenter or a plumber or something like that, it's really just one person. But small business, as defined by the SBA, they actually promulgate a whole set of regulations as to what they determine to be uh, small. And uh, under the North American Industry Classification System, uh, NAICS, for short, because SBA is all about acronyms. Uh, you will learn more acronyms learning about SBA than probably uh, anywhere else, uh, one of our claims to fame. Uh, but uh, they, they've actually gone through every single type of business that you can think of. They've got page after page after page, and they've actually said, well, for this business, we're going to measure size based upon revenue. That business, we're going to measure size based upon number of employees. And, and they, they really slice and dice it and get very granular in terms of what is determined to be small. Uh, so uh, for those of you budding SBA nerds at home, uh, if you want to look it up, uh, it is uh, 13 CFR 121.201 at sequence uh, uh, to find those codes. And you can actually find out you know, how the government determines what, uh, what small means. And what you'll find is that some businesses, I mean, you could have 1,500, 2,000, 3,000 employees and still be considered to be a small business within that industry. So it's all relative. Um, so that's one of the first things you have to uh, uh, figure out is, are, are, are we small? Um, the next thing is, is kind of a policy uh, determination, which is, uh, you know, the SBA said, well, look, you know, if our goal is to aid, counsel, assist, and protect small businesses, to start, build, and grow small businesses, you have to think about who's, uh, you know, who's writing these rules. It's Congress. And so, uh, you know, Congress believes that the reason why you do that isn't just because, well, small businesses are good, but we don't know exactly why. The reason why small businesses are good is, uh, and I don't know, this statistic has probably changed, but 77% of all new jobs uh, historically have been created by small businesses. And so the creation of jobs is a good thing because A, you know, we, we want our populace to be gainfully employed. Uh, but, you know, and then, you know, the cynic, you know, might say, and if you're employed, then you're going to do what? You're going to pay taxes. And if you pay taxes, government likes that because then they have more money to spend. So, you know, I, I vacillate between the idealist and the cynic, but uh, either way, you get to the same, uh, uh, the same end, which is, 
uh, SBA made the policy decision that, uh, you know, for-profit business further those goals more than lending to nonprofit businesses. Now, uh, that's actually been a challenge for those of us in the industry over the last year because the Paycheck Protection Program, which is this kind of redheaded stepchild of uh, 7A loans, uh, which we've been dealing with for the last 13 months now, uh, you know, has expanded uh, traditional SBA 7A loans to nonprofits. And we've all had to kind of wrap our heads around, okay, well, nonprofits look a lot and behave a lot different than a for-profit business. And how do we deal with that? But Hopefully, by the time you've graduated and you're dealing with this, you won't have to worry about nonprofits. You'll just be focusing on for-profit businesses, and that's the policy reason behind why we're focusing on that. Um, obviously, this is a United States federal government program, so you know, you know, uh, we're, we're looking at businesses that are here in the United States that are creating American jobs, that are helping the American economy. That kind of it's kind of obvious but you know if you don't say it there's some lawyer out there that's going to try to do an end run around uh, around those rules so they got to plug all those holes um okay so so those are kind of the basics and and those i would say you know that's not just 7a that is 504 that is microloan those are kind of eligible small business borrowers uh across the board when you get into 7a okay the 7a program is uh, uh, an interesting program and it's, it's different in terms of its ability to uh, give access to capital uh, 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 to small businesses because one of the uh, 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 main criteria is that a business can only access the 7A loan program if they can't access capital on reasonable terms anywhere else. So they can't be, uh, you know, the, the old say, you know, there's a, a, a joke in uh, commercial finance uh, that, uh, you know, you can't get a loan from a bank until you don't need a loan from a bank. So by the time you're sufficiently strong and have collateral and capital and things like that, that's when the bank wants to lend you money because their risk uh, is less. But at that point, you really don't need the bank loan. Uh, so the 7A program is really designed to kind of plug that gap and create a safety net. It expands a lender's credit box so that they can make a loan that they might not otherwise be able to make on an unguaranteed basis. The guarantee of that loan uh, provides the incentive to extend capital to a borrower that might not otherwise uh, qualify. And because of that, uh, the SBA program is not your typical commercial industrial or commercial real estate or asset based program, which oftentimes looks to collateral first. In fact, uh, one of the main reasons why 7A loans become 7A loans is because the business does not have uh, sufficient collateral to pledge uh, for the loan. But for 7A, that's not a problem. In fact, the, uh, the guidance uh, actually tells lenders that they are not allowed to turn down loans because there's not enough collateral. Uh, you know, but uh, uh, the, the criteria for qualifying for the loan is the business's ability to repay. So the lender, you know, uh, you know as opposed to how they typically look at commercial lending, uh, where they're looking at, well, what collateral do you have? And we're going to look to that first. In 7A lending, they're looking to the business's ability to repay. What is their historical financial performance? What is their projected financial performance? And do we have a, a reasonable assurance that this business is going to be able to repay this loan? And that is kind of the the uh, the pivot point, you know, the, the turning point for lenders to make the lending decision uh, there. Um, uh, so, so that's that's one of the things that's that's really unique about 7A loans. I know I uh, uh, we we hired an attorney, and this is probably going back 12 years ago. And she came out of one of the big uh, Center City Philadelphia firms, and it was her first week. And she walked into my office and she was holding the credit presentation from the lender. And she said, Ethan, I think they've made a terrible mistake with this loan because the loan to value ratio for this loan is like 685 percent. 
which means that the loan is 685% of the collateral that's being uh, pledged. And she said, that can't be right. And I said, no, no, <laughs> this is 7A. This is how this program works. So it allows borrowers, it allows businesses to, to access a higher level of capital than what uh, the collateral might otherwise justify. And the incentive to the lenders to do this is because the SBA says, hey, we're going to guarantee your loan. So in the event that this loan doesn't pay, if the business fails, if the loan defaults, we're going to guarantee a percentage of your loss. And it's not 100%, you know, usually it's 75 to 85%. Right now it's 90% across the board because uh, the government wants to continue to create sufficient incentive for lenders to lend, especially when lenders are pulling back conventionally. They want to make sure that SBA loans continue to flow. And we're seeing now, uh, you know, during this kind of uncertain economic time, uh, that SBA lending, 7A lending, 504 lending is all increasing uh, dramatically while conventional commercial lending is pulling back. We saw the same thing back in 2008, 2009 during the Great Recession. Uh, uh, SBA became, uh, in many cases, uh, the only game in town. So from that standpoint, it's a counter-cyclical uh, program because uh, you know when times are good, SBA lending is down. And it makes sense because businesses have a greater ability to access uh, capital on conventional terms. Uh, but when times are bad and banks and other lenders are tightening up, uh, SBA lending uh, goes through the roof. So uh, my, you know, personally, my practice is uh, uh, incredibly busy uh, right now with all the uh, SBA lending activity that's going on. Ethan, can I ask you, uh, and maybe you're going to address this later in the presentation, but at some point, can you address how the SBA sets the interest rate and the repayment terms on one of these seven A loans, and and there are other loans as well. Sure. No, let's let's talk about that now. That's a great question, Sam. Uh, so uh, the the SBA has a formula. Uh, for how they do this. Uh, in terms of interest rates, uh, they, uh, uh, the interest rates get set based upon uh, the, the term that's being offered um, uh, and uh, uh, the size of the loan. So, so larger loans and uh, longer terms have lower caps uh, and uh, 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 smaller loans with shorter terms have higher caps. Uh, uh, 7A loans can either be fixed rate products uh, or they can be uh, variable rate. Uh, I, I would say that in this environment right now where SBA is the only game in town, I'm seeing a lot more variable rate uh, uh, products just because it's uh, uh, th there's less competition uh, for these loans. And uh, SBA, uh, the 7A program has a robust secondary market uh, uh, that exists where the guaranteed portion of these loans are bought by uh, institutional investors. And uh, that allows community banks and uh, other lenders to recycle their capital. So they go out, you know, they make a million dollar loan. It's a 75% guarantee. They sell $750,000 off into the secondary market. Maybe they're making a 10% premium on that. So they get uh, seven, you know, they get seven, 50 back, which they can then relend, plus they're getting $75,000, which they can either relend or use to cover their overhead costs. Uh, uh, and the secondary market uh, really favors uh, variable rate loans because, uh, you know, it hedges their interest rate risks uh, if, if rates go up or down uh, in the future. They just kind of float along with it. Uh, typically, the maximum rate that you're seeing, though, for an SBA loan, uh, you know, of any size, uh, typically is uh, Wall Street Journal prime rate plus 2.75%. So right now, prime is at three and a quarter. So your, uh, your uh, initial uh, rate on a variable rate loan is 6%, which, you know, depending on who you are, you know, might sound high, might sound low, but certainly, uh, it, it, you know, the SBA is there not to be the best rate that you can get, but uh, it's meant to bridge the gap between conventional financing and hard money loans, which are basically lenders who are out there that make loans to businesses at credit card interest rates, you know, 15, 18, 20, 
you know, and some of the fintechs out there who, uh, you know, will, you know, when you actually compute the effective rate, you could get 30, 40, 45 even 50 percent uh so uh which which is uh, you know which is bad for any business uh it, it's mm -hmm. it's uh you know so so this provides a much more reasonable uh, rate and uh, uh uh access to capital in terms of the term uh for 7a loans that is dictated by uh what you're using the loan proceeds for and what the classes of collateral are so if you're doing a real estate uh secured loan where real estate is securing 50 percent or more of the loan you can go up to 25 years which is significantly longer than what you would see in a, a commercial uh, uh, commercial real estate or conventional commercial real estate uh, loan product, which may only go five, seven, maybe in the best case scenario, 10 years, uh, you know, you can uh, significantly reduce the monthly payment by amortizing it uh, out over 25 years. Uh, that's something else about 7A loans is that it is a straight line amortization, which means there are no balloon payments. So sometimes in a conventional setting, you'll say, well, for purposes of calculating interest, it's a 25 year term, but we're gonna have a balloon in year 10. So you're gonna pay interest, okay, like you're paying for 25 years, but then the loan matures uh, in year 10. SBA, it's straight line amortization. So if it's a 25 year amortization, it's a 25 year term and it gives borrowers a, uh, uh, a, a really advantageous uh, uh, monthly loan payment and uh, does not put them in any uh, uh, difficult straits in terms of, uh, you know, from a financing standpoint where, you know, they may have a loan come due and they've still got a large balance that still needs to be paid. Uh, you know, so that's, uh, so, that, uh, you, so typically 7A loans, the terms will range from 10 years to 25 years, and it just depends upon what the proceeds are being used for. Things like working capital, inventory, uh, you know, business acquisition, things like that, you're looking at a 10-year term. And then ultimately, if you're doing a mixed use of proceeds, uh, you'll do a weighted average of the various uses of proceeds to come up with a blended term, which would be somewhere between 10 and 25 years. Uh, so it really does strive to be as advantageous for the small business as possible. Okay, back to you, Brittany, unless that, someone else has a question. Skylar, did you, I know you had your hand up. Did you still have a question? Um, yeah, kind of, it's super quick though. Um, back to the eligibility requirements, Ethan, um, you mentioned that the SBA tends to look at the historical financial performance for the company. Is that, yep. any, is that anything specific as well? Um, no, it, it, it's not really industry specific because uh, if there is historical financial performance, you, you can actually do it for this particular business. Uh, now, something that 7A loans are often used for, and especially with, um, you know, what's been going on in the economy over the last year is uh, uh, 7A loans are often leveraged by lenders uh, for startup businesses. So these may be for brand new businesses that do not have uh, historical financial performance. And in those situations, lenders are required to look to industry standards. There are actually businesses out there that compile industry data that, that uh, will do an analysis of you know, here's how plumbers do in the mid Atlantic, you know, with this size of business. And here's how a carpenter will do in the Southeast, you know, with this many employees. And they'll actually uh, uh, aggregate that data. And then, of course, uh, you know, they're in business too. So they publish it and sell it uh, to banks that are looking to access this information uh, as part of their uh, credit underwriting process. And they will actually compare what the borrower has said they plan to do in their business plan against this industry data, uh, which hopefully is uh, 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 accurate uh, in terms of uh, you know, future performance. Thank you, because that's exactly the situation I was thinking about. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's interesting. It's interesting. Um, okay. Are we ready to talk about 504 loans? Um, I believe well, we do. Let me just mention, uh, I'm, and I apologize for not mentioning this before, uh, but Professor Tom Sharbaugh is sitting in on this session and mm -hmm. he runs our uh, clinic. Uh, Tom, can you just 
give us uh, 30, 30 seconds on your clinic. I had to get off mute there. Um, sure. Um, so uh, we have a, um, a clinic based at the law school and uh, what's different than I think um, most of these uh, clinics at other schools is we, we really have embraced uh, Penn State's land grant mission. And so we, we serve clients all over the state of, of Pennsylvania. We were using Zoom long before it became a household oh. word. And the, the clinic is large. We have, uh, we've been having about 18 students the last couple of semesters. And, and so I supervise students along with uh, a, a, a staff attorney, a fairly recent graduate who's been working there a couple of years. And we do organizational type work and, and basic funding work. Uh, most of our, our clients are not at the stage where anybody would lend the money. The, the comment earlier about you know, lending money when you don't need it is something I've told many clients over the years. Um, but we re represent you know, startup and early stage companies uh, all over and, and it's been a good experience for Pennsylvania and a good experience for our students. And let me just mention, uh, uh, before Tom joined the law school, he was the managing partner at Morgan Lewis in Philadelphia, which is uh, a large, uh, a large internationally based uh, law firm. So we, we are, we are especially um, uh, fortunate to have Tom here at the law school and working with our students. And one of his students is Brittany, who's doing a doing a paper uh, for this course that uh, that Tom is involved in. So thank you, uh, Tom. Happy to help. Brittany, it's back to you. Thank you. And I'll apologize to Ethan and Professor Haver because I already forced them to listen to everything about Professor Sharba's paper or the paper I'm doing. So sorry for that. Um, but yes, now I can move on. Loan type two, uh, 504. So as compared to, to recap with the 7A loans, again, the SBA is not actually giving these businesses any money. Um, they're just working with banks and helping with the terms and allowing these lenders to feel safe with their guarantee of repayment. So with the 504, very different. Um, the with 504, there's actually going to be a third party now coming, a, a different type of third party, a CDC, a, a certified development company, uh, which is a nonprofit corporation that the SBA authorizes the CDCs to provide the financing to these small businesses um, with the help of third party lenders, which are typically banks. Um, so here I, I was asking him before, but Ethan, if you just want to describe a little about like what the certification certified development companies are and like how do you what how do you be, become one um well I, I would never advise anyone to become a certified yeah. development company <laughs> like, oh my goodness don't do that um yeah so so certified development companies are uh agents for the sba uh you have to be uh -huh. licensed uh, by the SBA. Typically, CDCs are, uh, uh, they've usually got their fingers in a bunch of different pots uh, in terms of economic development. A lot of them are also community development financial institutions or have relationships with them. Uh, and uh, here in Pennsylvania, uh, you know, are often intermediaries for a lot of uh, Pennsylvania's uh, state programs. Uh, and Pennsylvania has uh, kind of a disproportionate number of state programs. Uh, I, many of my CDC clients uh, say that one of their biggest uh, competitors is the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, uh, yeah. as they shake their fist. Um, but uh, but but CDCs are in in the 504 uh, realm. They are licensed by the SBA to basically be their agents, to be their intermediaries uh, in. Uh, uh, offering these loans to small businesses. The 504 program is a much narrower loan program than 7A. 7A, you can make loans for any legitimate business purpose. Uh, 504, you are really looking at real estate, you know, improvement, you know, either real estate acquisition, real estate improvement, or buying some sort of long-term machinery and equipment. Uh, you know, and this is long-term depreciation. So these are, are you know, several hundred thousand dollar 
uh, uh, milling machines from a manufacturer, uh, you know, you, uh, you know, printing presses, uh, things like that. It's not tables and chairs. It's not, uh, uh, you know, beds and dressers in a hotel or televisions or things like that. So it's really got to be something that's going to be around uh, for a while. And uh, this is really a, a partnership. In the 7A program, it's the lender extending its capital with a contingent guarantee from the SBA. And the SBA says, hey, if you do everything the right way, dot your I's, cross your T's, then uh, we will guarantee any loss that you may suffer on this loan. In 504, it's, uh, I don't know, I, I, I'm Probably the best way to describe it is it is kind of this weird Rube Goldbergian uh, 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 structure where they have the bank come in and do a conventional unguaranteed loan at a 50% loan to value. So unlike 7A, which is not a collateral based program, 504 is. This is a much more kind of traditional from that standpoint, uh, commercial real estate program where the lender is only lending up to a certain percent of the appraised value of the collateral being pledged. Most 504 loans are real estate loans and uh, uh, most, uh, most commercial real estate lenders would kill to have a 50% loan to value ratio. That's a very good ratio because that means that if you're only at 50%, your loan is only 50% of the loan to value. If in the unfortunate event that you have to uh, liquidate the collateral, uh, you've got a two to one value there. Uh, and so you've got a very good chance that you're going to get repaid through liquidation. SBA uh, comes in through the CDC and takes, uh, takes a second position loan. So they're a mortgage or deed of trust in second position subject to uh, the bank's 50% LTV. Uh, typically they're doing 40%, but depending upon the nature of the program, it could be uh, as low as 30% with the owner contributing anywhere between 10 and 20%. And that just depends on, is this a, is this a new business? Uh, is there a track record? Is this a special use property that may be harder to liquidate? And if so, then uh, uh, the owner is asked to pony up uh, additional money uh, so that they have more skin in the game uh, for this. Uh, so uh, the, the, the certified development company, though, you know, I just told you, these are usually nonprofits. These are usually CDFIs or related to CDFIs, and they're usually community-based uh, 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 entities. And they're not sitting on a boatload of cash. So how do they fund these loans? Well, the way that they do it is they actually, uh, 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 these loans are funded through the sale of bonds once a month uh, in New York. And so all of these loans that are going to close, they issue all these bonds that are backed by these loans. The bonds have a full faith and credit guarantee from the federal government. So the SBA says these bonds are 100% guaranteed and, it, 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 and it's a full faith and credit guarantee, which means that, you know, hey, the United States just told you that this is guaranteed. And no matter what happens, if, if you know, we'll make you whole uh, if, if something happens here. And so it basically makes it like an investment grade security uh, for uh, lenders to, to buy or to, to investors to buy uh, uh, the equivalent of like a 10 year treasury note. Uh, usually the, uh, the yield on it is uh, uh, a point or two higher uh, than the 10 year treasury. And uh, that's why pension funds, insurance companies, and other institutional investors will buy up these bonds. They buy these bonds once a month. They settle. The money flows out to all the various loans that have uh, uh, contributed to this bond sale. And that's when, uh, uh, that's when the loan funds. Uh, so uh, in order to bridge that gap, actually, the bank usually comes in and does bridge financing, which gets refinanced by that 504 loan. Uh, once it funds once a month. So it is a uh, technically very complicated uh, process uh, here in the mid-Atlantic. Uh, 7A 
uh, uh, tends to outcompete 504 because 504 is just uh, too complicated. And I, I don't know. I, I'm not. I'm not sure why. Maybe we're just really impatient here uh, in the Mid Atlantic, and we don't have the patience for this. But uh, I, I would say that uh, 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 7A uh, is definitely the loan of choice. Has been uh, for uh, the 21 years that I've been doing this. Other parts of the country, uh, especially the Southeast and out west, California, Texas, Florida, Georgia, uh, there's a lot more 504 uh, activity uh, that goes on there. But yeah, we do we do a bit here, and uh, you know we're uh, uh, we're plucky so and stubborn, so we 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 keep going after it. Um, Ethan, can I ask yeah. you? Can I ask you um, two things? How does the, the certified development company, which you say is a, pri, a, pra, a, a, a nonprofit, you know, yes. how does it function? Where does it get its, its operating cash from? Uh, so it makes money from the, uh, uh, from the origination of these 504 loans. So it gets a fee uh, both for originating and for servicing these loans. Uh, and so it's something that as a CDC makes more and more of these loans, uh, there's kind of a, a recurring stream of revenue uh, that comes from the resulting portfolios. Uh, additionally, a lot of these uh, a lot of these CDCs are uh, 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 either affiliated with or part of or sponsored by uh, local governments. So oftentimes uh, 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 county economic development, uh, councils or authorities will uh, uh, you know, have uh, a relationship with these CDCs uh, is, is what we see here in Pennsylvania for sure. Uh, but that generally tends to be uh, the case across the country. Uh, as far as what I see, uh, a, lot, a lot of these, you know, again, CDCs generally are not one trick ponies. They're doing more than just SBA 504 loans. They may be uh, you know, a, a lot of CDCs are micro lenders. So these are the, the lenders who are doing the, the third type of loan that we're uh, going to talk about next, uh, which are these micro loans, which are generally, uh, uh, you know, mission based lenders, uh, community development, financial institutions, but it all kind of ends up kind of in the same uh, or similar place with these CDCs. Now, is it is it when you when you first said that CDCs are tax exempt? I wasn't thinking about uh, a tax exempt subsidiary, for example, of a city. But I, but now that you, the way you've sort of described them, I, I assume that they are sort of an arm of a government as opposed to being just a freestanding uh, tax exempt organization. Yeah, cer certainly uh, CDCs are not charities by any stretch of the imagination. So they're not 501c3s. Most uh, CDCs that I have worked with have either been 501c4s or c6s. Uh, so they're not necessarily uh, 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 you know, always, you know, tax exempt, but they are, uh, you are know, fully tax exempt, but they are nonprofits, uh, you know, so they, they, you know, they, they are mission based lenders from that perspective, uh, you know, and, and there's less of a uh, uh, profit motivation there, you know, 7A lenders are all uh, banks and other for-profit lenders. And, uh, you know, and we'll be talking about this a little bit more in the next hour with uh, Cassandra is, uh, you know, uh, the, the fact that, you know, 7A lending tends to be driven by, you know, kind of, you know, your typical capitalist market uh, forces, which, you know, sometimes makes it uh, not the best tool uh, for getting uh, uh, capital into underserved markets. I'm, I just want to ask you one sort of uh, sort of question. As a tax lawyer, I get tied up on numbers, you know, code section, code section this or code section that. How, I mean, what's the difference between, I mean, what, how did they end up with defining one loan as a 7A loan and another loan as a 504 loan? <laughs> okay. 
That is that is a great question. So 7A loans are called 7A loans because uh, that loan program uh, is created under Section 7A of the Small Business Act of 1953. 504 loans are called 504 loans because they are created under Section 504 of the Small Business Investment Act of 1958. And Brittany uh, showed us that back at the beginning. Uh, I actually probably for the first, I don't know, 10 or 12 years that I was doing uh, this type of work kind of wondered that but didn't really have time to look it up. Uh, but, but I am a certified SBA nerd. And so eventually I went digging and figured it out. But that's, uh, uh, that, that's the uh, glorious uh, uh, reason why these loans have the names that they do. <laughs> Back to you, Brittany. Okay. Um, so we've pretty much covered the 504. Um, everything, basic uses, the main um, difference to note though, which is that the, these loans could not be used for the working capital or inventory, um, which was a pretty big um, isolating or difference between the two of them on how much is actually available, the uses wise. And then last, sorry, we'll get into the micro loans that we were discussing. Um, so these obviously huge difference compared to the $5 million amount. These will be more of a 50 or the maximum amount is only $50,000. Um, again, the eligibility requirements and the terms that will be set depend on the intermediary that you're using, um, but these loans can be used for working capital, inventory, fixtures, or machinery. And, and because those intermediaries uh, tend to be mission-based lenders like certified development companies, uh, you know, th this is an area where uh, uh, you know, SBA, I mean, SBA doesn't come out and say serve underserved communities, but they're saying we're going to give you the intermediary, the money, and you go out and you fulfill your mission with it. So oftentimes you'll see microloans uh, being a little bit more uh, mission based and a little bit more focused on serving uh, underserved uh, uh, communities. So businesses that might not otherwise be able to access capital for whatever reason, uh, you know, are the targets of microloans. The problem with the microloan program is it's capped at fifty thousand uh, dollars per business. So it, there, there's only so far that uh, that that program can take you before you flip over and start looking at the seven A program, which has the similar uh, eligible use of proceeds. With the microloans, are they funded the same as those five hundred four? Like, is it through the sale of bonds or? No, no, the SBA actually makes direct loans using taxpayer dollars. So, so the, the one nice thing about the 7A program and the 504 program is uh, they are both what are called zero subsidy uh, programs, which means that uh, uh, you know, taxpayer dollars are not being used uh, to fund any of the losses uh, in these programs. These programs are being uh, funded through uh, their own uh, uh, you know, their own generation of, uh, of fees and uh, 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 income, uh, which is great. Uh, the microloan program is a, is, a, uh, is a subsidy program. However, uh, the other, uh, 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 you know, we talked about just briefly, the SBIC program is a subsidy program. And the third program that's a subsidy program is the disaster loan program, which is administered by the SBA. Uh, as well. Uh, and those are all taking taxpayer dollars and putting them out the door uh, to uh, then be relent uh, to the ultimate end user uh, businesses. But uh, uh, 7A is paid through primarily through fees paid by the lenders and the borrowers. 504, uh, you know, it's, it's being funded through the sale of these bonds. So it, 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 it's you know, from a political standpoint, and not to make this a political discussion, but anytime you're talking about government uh, 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 backed programs, you can't help but talk about politics. One of the nice things about this program, uh, or all of these programs, is uh, they have uh, enjoyed uh, a fairly uh, uh, universal bipartisan uh, support uh, in Congress. Uh, you know, which, which is nice because you don't get involved uh, usually in the political uh, food fights that tend to go on in Washington. Great. So then to sum or 
the last thing that focuses more on the topic of our conversation or our, our class, um, Ethan had mentioned earlier, I'm not sure if it was the class or to just us, but that there's with the SBA, there's not really any specific loans that are specifically targeted at like getting capital um, through loans to these minority businesses. So instead, the most impactful, I suppose, of the programs SBA offers to target it, that are targeting the minority startups would be through the contracting assistance programs. Um, so for instance, these are the three main programs, the Women-Owned Small Business Federal Contracting Program, um, in which the federal government's goal is to award at least 5% of all federal contracting dollars to women-owned small businesses each year. Um, for the service of it, disabled veteran-owned small businesses, their goal again is only is 3% here. And then for the 8A Business Development Program, uh, the federal government's goal is to award at least 5% of all federal contracting dollars to small disadvantage, disadvantaged businesses each year. So while, as we said earlier, contracting is one way that um, the SBA helps, it's not, it, it, it's also one of the only ways that they're specifically targeting minority businesses and, and helping them. Um, so I think that that'll be something we'll obviously discuss further in the policy discussion after the break, but I just wanted to bring that up too. And now I'll go back to any questions. How is disadvantaged uh, dis defined, Brittany? By the SBA? For, yeah, for the yes. 8A program. I'll let you know, hold on, very specifically. Um, not, or not having the, okay, be at least 51% owned and controlled by a citizen that is socially and economically disadvantaged, have a personal net worth of $750,000 or less, adjusted gross income of $350,000 or less, and $6 million or less in assets. So that is defined- A lot of well-off people are gonna be qualifying as disadvantaged businesses. Mm -hmm. Yes, well also I'm, hold on a second. If you give me one moment, sir, I can find it in the CFR for you. Unless Ethan knows it off the top yeah. of his head. And you don't oh no, it. no, I, I not not off the top of my head, but uh, all all I will say, is, uh, Sam, is that you're right. Uh, that doesn't sound terribly disadvantaged, um, you know. And you know, ju just like small, you know, and you actually start looking at how uh, the SBA defines small, uh, you know, sometimes it doesn't look very small. And uh, I, I, I think that's, you know, that, that's, that's one of the things that sometimes people miss is that, um, you know, this isn't, you know, small, you know, as with respect to everyone else, this is small with respect to other businesses in your industry. It is disadvantaged as, a, you know, with, you know, you know, as compared to other people who are doing this thing. And so they've, they've drawn, you know, what some might, uh, say are arbitrary lines, and certainly, uh, certainly they have. But uh, you know, from uh, you know, from from the agency standpoint, they have to draw the line somewhere. From a lender standpoint, uh, lenders like bright lines because then they know when when they're on the right side of it and when they're on the wrong side of it, and so it's very easy for them to do that. Uh, you know, one of the uh, one of the tests that uh, they used to have in SBA lending in the 7A and 504 programs was something called the personal resources test. And they had this, this you know, complicated mathematical formula, which is why I went to law school and didn't become a CPA. But here we are again uh, with me having to do math, uh, you know, was, was you know, based upon the size of the loan that you were uh, getting, there was some factor that they would apply to it and they'd say, well, you know, if you have liquid assets, you know, exceeding, you know, this multiplier of the project, then you are not uh, uh, eligible uh, to get a, an SBA taxpayer backed loan. Uh, you know, I always think of this as the rich people don't get SBA loan. Uh, rule because as a practical matter, you know, that's not in the agency's mission. 
You know, it's not to help every single small business in the country. It's to help the ones that need the help. It's to help the ones that can't get credit elsewhere. And uh, the agency actually just tried to bring back that per personal resources test, uh, which they did uh, through a rule that was issued on uh, March 11th of last year and then got rescinded uh, in the CARES Act. Uh, on March 27th, uh, which uh, if you're wondering why we had a rule that was out there for only 16 days, uh, it was because the SBA administrator uh, upset the uh, chair of the Senate Small Business Committee, and that was his political payback. Uh, so, so let this be a lesson to you. Do not upset the chair of the Senate Small Business Committee. But uh, Ethan, so... so um... A person has, let, let, let me take two, two different loan applicants, okay? One is Sam Thompson, who's black and who has uh, $4 million in assets and a $200,000 million, $200, salary. Another one is Tom, and he's got the same thing. Uh, would I qualify for the disadvantaged business? Well, Tom Witten, who I, I suspect that Tom is white. Tom has the bald guy exception. <laughs> <laughs> hey, me too. <laughs> hey, look, I, I, I'm, it's only because of Rogaine. <laughs> Um, so, Sam, to, to your question, um, I'll, I'll, I'll be very candid. I don't know the answer uh, to it because I really uh, I, I focus uh, primarily in the loan programs. Uh, disadvantaged businesses is really in the contracting program. And I know just enough about that to make myself extraordinarily dangerous to both myself and to others. Uh, and, and if I tried to answer your question, I would be uh, I would be guessing, um, you know, in the loan do, you, do yeah. you have a view, Cassandra? Well, I was gonna say, but I wanna take an educated guess at that because I think that really when we begin to think about credit worthiness, what's gonna happen is that the bank is gonna look at the profile of the borrower that it feels like is gonna have the best ability to repay. Um, and so one of the, among the policy um, changes that need to be done is looking at you know, these definitions that we just talked about of small and disadvantaged businesses um, and giving them some more meaningful terms um, as it relates to uh, emerging businesses that are actually trying to compete with this, these SBA funds. But, but, but specifically, uh, we aren't talking, about, I, I said, what if we were applying for a loan, but what if we were applying for uh, contracting assistance and you got Sam Thompson on the one hand. Okay, I don't know, got, I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm like Ethan, and I don't know the contracting assistance. Yes, yeah. okay. Good. Um, I can't help with okay. much practical guidance because it they don't give it to you, but I can tell you what the SBA says, which is a small business must be 51% at least 51% owned and controlled by a socially and economically disadvantaged individual or individuals. African Americans, Hispanic Americans, Asian Pacific Americans, subcontinent Asian Americans, and Native Americans are presumed to qualify. Other individuals can qualify if they show by a quote preponderance of the evidence that they are disadvantaged, um, but all individuals must have a net worth of less than $750,000, excluding the equity of the business and their primary residence. Great. Hey, by the way, uh, Ethan, this young lady is going to be a great lawyer. She looked it up, uh, you know, just like that. That's, that was very impressive, uh, Brittany. Very <laughs> impressive. Thank you. Um, That's real life. That's what you do. You don't always know all the answers. You got to figure it out. So do you guys want to take a break now? Is it is now a good time to take a break? I think that'd be great because now we'll come back after the break and switch to Professor Hayward and Ethan in the, more of the policy discussion in the banks. Good. Okay. So um, it's 5.03. Why don't we come back right at 5.10? Okay. Great. Sounds good. All right. Okay, we're ready to oh. go. Okay. I'm here. Thank you. Okay, Brittany, you want me to just start talking? Good thing, yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to spend a few minutes um, 
uh, doing something that I'm called, I called one article talking about synergy and fr friction, okay? Um, and so what I'm suggesting is that in order to have a more robust uh, minority lending program um, at the SBA, there has to be more cooperation between um, the banks um, and um, the, uh, the bank regulatory programs and the SBA regulatory programs uh, in order to make it work. So we, as Brittany explained earlier, uh, we have the SBA um, guaranteed loan program because it's difficult for small businesses to get loans. And yet, as um, I think Ethan indicated, you know, small businesses uh, comprise a large part of the economy uh, and they certainly employ uh, a large number of employees. And that's exactly why, you know, as soon as the pandemic hit, uh, Congress authorized uh, the payroll protection program as a way of uh, trying to ease the shock uh, that might come if a lot of businesses had, had to close. So we'll talk about that more in a few minutes. Um, but the point is, is that government has always recognized that small businesses are important, that small businesses need access to capital and that the traditional banks are gonna have a hard time um, providing that access for several reasons. Um, the first one is that there's something that we call market imperfections, okay, or information asymmetries. The fact that banks really don't know small businesses well, often they don't know that industry, uh, especially if these are emerging or new businesses. Um, and so it's very difficult for them to understand how the business might have the ability to repay, uh, how it's gonna earn its uh, capital. Uh, and again, it doesn't have collateral sources usually. Um, uh, to support it and to make it look um, as though it's going to be uh, credit worthy and more successful. So because of the market imperfections and the information asymmetries, um, the small business loan um, agency was created um, as a way of, again, providing access and to provide the quality of products uh, that small businesses need. And in this way, also, certainly what uh, Congress is doing is supporting innovation because a lot of ideas uh, for uh, developing industry come from small businesses, you know, that start out small and of course, you know, grow up to grow to be very large. Um, and so some of the, just a quick aside, some of the SBA funding that's been very successful um, has resulted in Costco, Home Depot, Staples, okay? So just an idea of why we need, you know, government, government sponsored lending in this particular sector. But the other reason it's very difficult for uh, small businesses to uh, be able to get bank funds is because- hey, Sandra, could, could yes. you excuse me a minute? Mm -hmm. Would you just say again, what you just said about those three firms? Because oh. I had never heard that before and I wanna make oh. sure I, I, I wasn't mishearing you. Well, okay, this is what, this is what I'm not, okay, not the, necessarily the programs we've been talking about, but there's small business, there were small business investments in Home Depot, Costco, and Staples that helped them to grow. Small from SBA investments. From well, yes, there's small business investment um, corporation. Is it called SBIC? Yep. Yeah. And I uh, actually, oh. I can send it over to you, Brittany. I have a picture of um, of some of those the logos, and you would recognize a lot of the names. So I'll do that in, in just a few minutes. Ethan, you were going to say something? Oh, yeah. I was also going to say FedEx is one of the ones that they always trot out uh, as, as being started oh, that's right. uh, with support from the SBA. So a lot of a lot, a lot of you know, brand names uh, you know, got, their, uh, got their start from uh, relatively humble beginnings. That is, that is I, I had no idea that that was the case, but that, that is very impressive. And, that, well, and that's also the, what brings up the, the issue in terms of relationship lending and the relationship that um, borrowers need to have with a bank, okay? So banks rely on upon relationship lending, meaning that they are looking for the, uh, they're looking to have, understand the business, understand the customers, understand the conditions and the availability uh, under which they're making credit. And a lot of minority and women-owned businesses don't have those banking relationships. And so that actually reduces their availability to credit. And businesses are not, and banks are not willing to lend to them because they don't again have the same knowledge base. They don't feel like that information wedge the in the information asymmetries has been closed. Um, and so that makes it again very difficult um, 
for them to access credit. And it makes them um, very vulnerable uh, in terms of being able you know, to have a continuous um, business plan. So just a few minority business stats. 30% uh, of small businesses are owned by, by business owners of color. 45% of the firms um, were at least 50% women owned. Uh, and about one seventh of the firms are owned by immigrants. And that's information from the Small Business Administration. But it is because of the banking relationship um, that a lot of um, small businesses lack uh, that uh, they were excluded from the um, PPM program. And so what I wanna talk about now for a few minutes is this whole idea of being underbanked uh, and financial exclusion. So Brittany, you have a slide about that. Okay, so when we think about um, financial, there's a slide before that one, I think, or after, yeah, okay. After 2008, this shows the decline in uh, bank branches. And there was an alarming, um, they closed at an alarming rate. And so we can see here uh, that they went uh, 95,000, uh, down to about 85,000. And the issue with that is that lots of branches uh, closed in economically distressed communities. They closed in rural communities. Um, and some metro areas lost anywhere from 15 to 20% of their banks. Uh, rural and small towns, of course, were also impacted a lot. Um, Hispanic and Native American populations were very vulnerable. And in the absence of banks, um, people go to other alternative lenders, uh, like check cashers, like uh, payday lenders, um, other predatory actors. Now, this is also true in the small business um, sphere, because with the advent of fintech, okay, or uh, sources of funding that use alternatives to credit scoring outside the traditional method. Now, a lot of businesses are getting their money not through, a lot of small businesses uh, are getting their money not through banks because they don't have these relationships, uh, but instead through FinTech. So FinTech doesn't rely on traditional credit scores. Um, and instead they say that they rely on um, big data. Okay, and big data is almost any data that's out there uh, about a person. Uh, and it can be um, solid, you know, in terms of verifying name, address, how long you've been working somewhere, uh, or it can be soft, uh, connections through one's Facebook pages um, and what that seems to indicate about someone. Um, and so that's how FinTech decides on the interest rates. And so what we're finding is that lots of small businesses that don't have relationships with banks are resorting to fintechs because they're able to get funding that way when they've been locked out of the traditional credit markets. Um, and so fintech has grown exponentially uh, over the last, what, uh, seven or eight years. Uh, and it's opening up a lot of doors, uh, but it also is opening up doors to often to borrowers who are not as financially sophisticated. Cassandra, uh, yes. two, um, two things. One, mm -hmm. one uh, I'm gonna ask you two questions. Okay. N number one, I, I assume that one of the reasons for that precipitous drop in the number of bank branches is, has been the, the number of bank mergers that have, where banks, you know, one bank acquires another bank, they have two branches and in state college, so they close right. one of the branches. I suspect right. that, that's, that that's one of the reasons for this drop. It is. Okay. And of course the profit margins, you know, how much is the bank, how much is that branch actually bringing in? Yes, okay. Yeah, and, and if the branch is, if the branch is located in a, in a minority community that's, and is not as profitable as the branches in the majority community, they're, they're, they're likely to be, particularly right. if you have, as a result of the merger, if you have two branches in that minority community, you're gonna you're gonna close the branch, close right. one. Right, right. You're, you're gonna close one. Branch. Right. And again, technology also allows banks to say, "Well, we still are offering the services to the community, 
It's just that we're offering them in a different way. Now, uh, you have to excuse me, but because of my age, I would just like for you to take a minute and just tell us what FinTech actually is, please. Okay. So FinTech is a way of combining, you know, basically two words, finance and technology. Okay. And so it is a way of, um, it's an alternative way of providing credit. And it basically uses alternative ways of assessing credit worthiness or scoring um, credit in order to determine, um, to verify the data about the person and also to determine, of course, the interest rates. Uh, the problem is that the FinTech industry is not very well regulated uh, and there's not a lot of data that's available to, um, um, well, I shouldn't, there's data available to see how they're lending but there's not a lot, there are not a lot of controls on the way in which they do lend. Uh, and so it is, it, it, it's very easy for it to run amok uh, without any, you know, any way of reeling it back in. Are they subject to banking regulation? They are not right now. So recently the OCC has said that it would allow FinTechs to have a federal charter. Um, but the problem is that we have a dual system of banking and the way the OCC has protected its turf, um, if there's a federal charter, the state rules will not apply. And so uh, while a state might be, want to be more restrictive and say to FinTech, we wanted you to put, or say to any bank, we, we have caps on the kinds of the interest rates that you can put on loans. Um, the Fed would say, uh, OCC would say, well, you're preempted from doing that. So most fintech are then organized as state financial institutions. Right now, they are they they are regulated under state regulations, right? But um, again, OCC is going to offer them offer some of them a federal charter. But then you got you have to assume that they're going to be able to meet the demands of OC of the regulatory structure. So there are you know certain regulations that. Um, organizations have to go through that want to become uh, federal, federally insured lending institutions. And so we're gonna have to assume that the FinTechs will be able to meet those in order to even get the federal charter. Interesting. <clears throat> okay, so one of the problems with the use of alternative credit scoring is that um, lots of algorithms are used and algorithms which may appear neutral in their face often can um, introduce de facto discrimination into the borrowing decision. And so that's something that really, again, is very difficult to control. Um, and there could be violations of protection and fair lending laws, and there's really no way to know about it uh, unless the data is collected. And so there was a move a few years ago to have the uh, CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection uh, Bureau, to collect this data um, as it relates to small business lending uh, but that didn't work. And so there is, you know, the, again, there's no way to uh, be able to know what's going on and to supervise the data. I mean, I'm sorry, to supervise the lending through data. So let's talk now about the payroll protection program and some of the problems that um, minority owned businesses especially had um, as a result of um, the way SBA set up the program. So um, most minority and small owned businesses evidently that applied for the payroll protection program. Well, let me back up. Does everybody know what the payroll protection program is? Maybe not. I think we, we, we <laughs> talked about it at the beginning of the okay, class. Okay, good. But it may okay. make sense, sense to, uh, to, um, to um, review it. And, okay. and, and, and as I, I should have indicated at the beginning, this, this class is being um, taped and would be, it's going to be up on the Penn State website, so it'll be available to anyone who wants to listen to it. So I think it would be a good idea to, to take a minute on that. Okay, so the Payroll Protection Program uh, is a program that uh, Congress uh, put in place through the SBA last year, about this time, um, as a way to ease the financial shock of the uh, COVID recession. The Payroll Protection Program required uh, lenders, I'm sorry, required borrowers to keep their employees in place for um, a period of, I think, was it three months, um, Ethan? 
it was uh it, it was initially eight weeks uh and then as uh uh, as we realized that COVID was going to be more than just a, a two month, uh, you know, shelter in place, uh, they expanded it to 24 weeks. Okay. So the condition of getting the loan and having it turn into a grant, which would not have to be repaid, was that the employees had to stay on the payroll. And that's why it's called the payroll protection uh, program. But what we found out is that minority um, owned businesses were disadvantaged by it. Now, they were disadvantaged by it for several reasons. Uh, one of them was that um, most small and minority uh, owned businesses did not have a relationship with uh, a lender. Okay, they had never applied for credit or they had been denied credit in the past by um, the institutions to which they belong. Uh, so that was a problem. Also, the largest businesses that had very strong and deep relationships with their lenders um, basically uh, were first in line the lenders um, held funds for them and sort of protected them. Um, and so by the time that a lot of the minority businesses applied for credit, the money was gone. Um, there were other reasons that the SBA program um, didn't work as well for minority businesses, uh, including the fee structure. Um, so the fee structure, there was a fee structure that was graduated and the larger the amount of the payroll protection loan, the larger the fee that the bank received, um, and so for some of the small loans um, that minority businesses, uh, smaller amounts that minority businesses are making loans for, um, the banks were not gonna make a lot of money. Um, and so, you know, the higher the loan, the higher the, the fee. Actually, um, Cassandra, I, mm -hmm. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, okay, the, no. the, fee the fee structure was actually inverted. So while uh, the, the, the actual dollar of the fee that you would get for a larger loan would be a higher amount. Uh, for loans over $2 million, the fee uh, that lenders received was 1% of the loan amount. And actually for the smallest loans, uh, I believe it's under 350,000, uh, it was 5% of the loan amount. And those fees actually in the second draw uh, of PPP that we're in right now uh, has been, uh, they, they actually put in a floor uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, for the really small loans under $50,000, it would be financially worthwhile for lenders to make these loans and that there would be a financial incentive there. Um, yes. So cer certainly, you know, if, if you did a $10 million PPP loan, uh, you know, and you're getting 1% uh, of that, you're making $100,000 on that deal. And, and yeah, I get it. But, uh, you know, you know, certainly, you know, for the lenders that have really kind of leaned into uh, the Paycheck Protection Program, you see a lot of the top lenders, uh, their average loan amount may only be, uh, you know, 18 or $20,000. So I think certainly, uh, those that incentive, you know, again, the market always responds to what uh, is incentivized. And I think especially in this round, uh, we have seen uh, we've seen uh, a lot of lenders doing a lot of uh, smaller loans. Interestingly, some of the lenders who are kind of leading the charge with that are kind of non-traditional uh, financial technology uh, lenders, which is which is fascinating to me because you know you're kind of seeing them on 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 either uh, 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 either end of the spectrum here uh, with the paycheck uh, uh, protection program. The other thing I just wanted to uh, just mention is that certainly uh, there were lenders that were uh, doing things which certainly. Uh, did not look like giving equal access to capital uh, for some of their uh, uh, for some of their customers. Uh, but I guess as 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 somebody who represents lenders and not to be an apologist for them, but uh, certainly Congress kind of set them up. And, uh, uh, you know, because the way that they actually structured uh, the Paycheck Protection Program, they required lenders to do, uh, you know, uh, to comply with anti-money laundering uh, laws and know your customer laws. They, they basically said, well, if you've already done KYC, know your customer, which is basically verifying that, you know, your, your customer is who they say they are and, you know, isn't, you know, some nefarious, you know, ne'er-do-well. Uh, you, you know, that uh, if you've already done that verification, then you can rely upon that. Uh, but if it's a brand new customer, you have to go through the whole KYC process. And the bank regulators have made that a very burdensome, onerous process. And so at the time, 
you know, 12 months ago when we were sitting here not knowing what COVID was, there was a tremendous amount of pressure on banks to get this money out the door as fast as possible. In fact, uh, the SBA came in and said, you got to get it out within 10 days of the application because what they wanted was they wanted lenders, uh, you know, they, they didn't want lenders to sit on these approvals, you know, and just kind of camp out, you know, and say, well, we got these approvals and we'll take our time. Uh, you know, they wanted the money to get out there to help keep people employed. And so, uh, you know, they, they, the way the whole program was set up, they were incentivized to, you know, kind of look to their own customers first and only after they did that to look to outside. So, you know, to, you know, it, it definitely had a disparate impact, uh, but um, it wasn't, you know, it, it, it wasn't necessarily uh, something that was intentional. It's, it's kind of a law of unintended consequences uh, here. And it well, definitely did. It's, sort of the, yeah. it's the SBA. A lot of what I'm talking about are SBA yeah. barriers, okay? Yeah. There are barriers yeah. in the regulatory structure. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so you're right. That's really what needs to be changed and what needs to be thought about. Uh, yeah. But um, again, the first round PPP, the fee structure did not incentivize, you know, the right. small loans. Right. Uh, and it's good that it's good that both the SBA and Congress were able to uh, rectify that so quickly and to to make you know make amends for this particular round. Yeah. Um, among the other issues um, is that um, there were not um, businesses that had non-employees had to wait to apply for PPP loans the first round, uh, and a lot of smaller minority a lot of minority owned uh, and women owned small businesses. Um, are not employees, they're self proprietorships. Okay. Yep. Um, and so again, they were not put on equal footing and uh, weren't able to have access to the um, uh, loans in that regard. And then, of course, um, um, you know, the idea of having to keep the workers on is um, a good one, but it's not, it was not certainly long term sustainable, sustainable, you know. And, we were dealing with an unknown. We weren't sure how long the pandemic would, pandemic would last. Um, and so um, this was a pool of money that you know, basically evaporated um, very quickly. Uh, but, and I bring up PPP just because I think it does show, um, it's sort of a good example of some of the structures in the SBA that don't encourage um, minority and women owned uh, businesses that don't encourage access to capital for them. Um, one of the other things that happens um, in the way the SBA um, uh, hands out money is that there's a, there is a, I call it a pot of money that's not fair, but a pool of money uh, that's allocated each year by Congress. Um, and that money uh, is distributed basically on a first come first serve basis. Is that right, Ethan? Uh, in terms of the loan programs? Right. Meaning it's um, not, there are no geographical allocations, there are no- right. No, my there, except for special programs like the micro loans, there are no specific yeah. allocations. Um, yeah, uh, I, I would, I would just, uh, I, I would say there, there's not actually a pool of money. It's really just an authorization uh, oh, because, right. okay. you know, be, because it's coming off the bank's balance sheet or it's being funded with the bonds in the 504 program. Uh, you know, the, the Congress basically just sets a limit, and they say, you know, right now the limits for fiscal 2021 are uh, $30 billion of 7A loans. And I believe it's either eight or $10 billion of 504 loans. But those are, you know, those aren't, that's not a, a you know, they're not saying here's $40 right. billion, go, go forth and don't do anything I wouldn't do. They say, you can do this much. And if you hit the cap, you can't do any more this fiscal year. And right. that's really just to manage the risk in the program. Now, how, but, is, right. that but, how is that allocated? Is it allocated by pop? I mean, do, is there any no. allocation like California because it's such a big state? No, that's no. one. That's one of the problems. Yeah, yeah. And that's why I call it first come first serve. Yeah. Um, because whoever, whichever institutions are able to get their borrowers to the SBA guaranteed loan program, those are the ones that get the money. Right. Yeah, we haven't we haven't had an issue hitting the funding cap since I think it was. Uh, either 2016 or 2017. The 7A program uh, used to have an $18.5 billion cap 
and uh, we hit it. I, I think it was in 2017. We hit it in July. The federal fiscal year ends September 30th. And we're everybody sitting there in July, like looking at each other going, what are we going to do, you know, for, for the next, uh, you know, next month and a half uh, here, next two and a half months. And uh, ultimately, Congress stepped in and raised that cap. Uh, we haven't come close to hitting the $30 billion cap yet. Uh, but my my guess is is that uh, you know, and and we're not even on pace to hit it this year, even with all the incentives. But at some point we will. Uh, but again, you're right. There is no allocation. There's nothing that says that we're setting aside this much here or this much there. That was actually something that Congress did with uh, with PPP uh, because they started to kind of you know put you know, the, the total, you know, I mean, PPP, just for comparison, 7A is a $30 billion program. PPP is going to be over 900 billion uh, by the time it's done. And, uh, uh, you know, so the, the, the numbers are just uh, vast and mind boggling, but they actually started breaking out little subsets and saying, all right, we're going to target this much here. We're going to target this much there. And certainly that's something I, I think, you know, one of the things that the SBA has, has demonstrated as they've kind of, uh, you know, they, they say, you know, that PPP, they've been building the airplane while it's in the air. Uh, you know, and I think they have learned some lessons and we've seen that with what they did in the Economic Aid Act. There was more targeted financing. Uh, you know, they corrected some of the fee incentives uh, for lenders. And, uh, you know, th there may be some things that they take away from this in terms of how they've kind of targeted this money uh, to make sure that it gets to un underserved uh, communities. And certainly uh, it wasn't done perfectly. It was done in a hurry. And, uh, you know, but they have demonstrated a willingness to kind of learn from their mistakes, for sure. I hope that they learn, uh, you know, some of the take some of the lessons from PPP and are able to translate that over into their uh, standard loan programs to uh, make them more effective at targeting these underserved communities. I think that's right. So, but let's just think about what that means. You know, if there are no allocations um, and the bank is really the one deciding who's going to get the SBA guaranteed loan, the bank is evaluating the credit worthiness um, of, of its potential borrowers, just like it does be for other loans. And yet the SBA guarantee is a real plum because the bank's exposure um, on that loan, should it default, um, is less. And of course, it also requires the bank to put up less of its own capital. So you know, it's a and real the bank benefit. can sell and the bank can sell the loan, right? And, the, and then the bank can sell the loan on the secondary market. That's right. Um, and, and right. And be able to recycle, you know, start that whole lending cycle over again. Um, and so when we just as we just, you know, Brittany pulled up those definitions for us of disadvantage and small, you can see how it just, you know, all of a sudden um, money that was set aside. What well, what we might think of as a small business, you know, or struggling in emerging business. Money that's been set aside for it is so competitive that they're not able to get in the door almost. Um, and so structurally, again, it sounds simple, but some of these definitions need to be changed. You know, some of the allocations, uh, there need to be some allocations uh, set aside, I think, for certain types of businesses. Um, um, and in that regard, uh, we can, um, you know, ensure more a, a, level, a more level playing field, I think, uh, and more diversity in the program. Now, I, I think, oh, go ahead. Let me just ask you a quick question. Mm -hmm. Someone was mentioning the amount of money. Was that you, Ethan, or was that you, Cassandra? The, the, the allocation, the amount allocated to these, um, these programs, the 7A program and the 504 program. Ethan told yeah, you that, the number. That, that was me, yeah. Guilty. <laughs> what what is the number? Uh, so the seven A program is a thirty billion dollar a year program, which means that uh, lenders are authorized to make up to thirty billion dollars of seven A loans. I believe the five hundred four program. I believe it's an eight billion dollar a year program, but uh, I don't have that one. Uh, 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 you know, as uh, 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 off the top of my head, uh, but the PPP. Uh, you know, in terms of the total, uh, the total amount of funding uh, is uh, by the time, assuming that they use uh, the, the balance of the money that's been appropriated for the Paycheck Protection Program, there, as of Sunday, 
Uh, there was about $51 billion left uh, from Congress's appropriation. Uh, depending on who you ask, some people say we're going to be done with that uh, by the end of uh, April. Uh, some think it may last uh, into May. Um, you know, some people think that we're not going to get through all of it, but I think there's a much better chance that we're going to get through all that. Uh, but by the time, assuming that we spend it all, it's going to be over $900 billion of Paycheck Protection Program uh, loans. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's, I don't know, 30 years of uh, SBA 7A lending uh, compressed into, uh, you know, just over, it'll be 14 calendar months yeah. uh, by the time we're done. You know, one of the things that a reaction to those figures here is that the these SBA loans have a de minimis impact on the economy um, because they're so small. I mean, 30 billion of, of 7A loans plus 8 billion of 504 loans has got to be like less than 1% probably a lot less than 1% of the, of the gross domestic product. So, I mean, it's like a drop in the bucket. It, it, it is. And historically, the SBA has, has kind of flown under the radar. I mean, you know, I, I mean, when we were just, you know, when 7A was just an $18.5 billion program, you know, we, we really didn't get much, uh, you know, much attention. Uh, you know, from Capitol Hill, from uh, from the White House, uh, you know, I mean, you know, and, and when we finally got the 30 billion authorization, what we like to say was, OK, you know, now we've arrived as an industry. But of course, you know, be careful what you wish for, because, of course, the Exim Bank, uh, which got uh, uh, scuttled by Congress, that was also a 30 billion dollar a year program. So we were like, Ugh, you know, be careful what you wish for. Uh, but we now uh, have gotten attention. And then with the uh, with the Paycheck Protection Program and the CARES Act uh, being passed on March 27th of 2020, uh, you know, we, we kind of got shoved out into the middle of the stage, right out into the spotlight, you know, and, and the administration, you know, put the captain's hat on uh, SBA and Treasury and said, go forth and uh, save the country, uh, you know, and it was kind of a weird place uh, to be, you know, as somebody who's kind of practiced in this little backwater of uh, you know federal administrative law and finance uh, for the last 21 years, uh, you know it was like being uh, you know the nerdy kid that nobody wants to sit with in the middle school lunchroom suddenly becoming the captain of the football team, and everybody <laughs> wanted to wanted to know and understand SBA lending, and uh, it was like wait a minute where have you guys been for the last 20 years, and uh, you know and from uh, you know from Main Street to Wall Street, I mean uh, you know I've been I've been getting calls from. Uh, large investment banks, AM 100 law firms that are like trying to figure this stuff out and don't understand uh, all of the SBA regulations. It's it's been a a, a very weird time, uh, but not just for those of us in the industry. The folks at the agency have also kind of been up against it. I mean, mm -hmm. you you got to think. You know, they were given 10 days to stand up a loan program that was at the time I think it was 10 times the size of their flagship loan program. They were given 10 mm -hmm. days to do it. No, oh, by the way, don't screw it up because the country is going to uh, you know, go up in flames if you do. So they definitely were not perfect uh, for sure, but uh, certainly uh, uh, you know, they, they, they worked very hard and have been working very hard and continue to work very hard. I mean, they're, they're continuing to be, to be asked to stand up new loan programs. Uh, you know, there's this shuttered venue operators grant program, which is, be, you know, just been launched. There's one uh, a program uh, benefiting with the restaurant revitalization program. And these are all new things that are being cut from whole cloth uh, that have, have, are, are things that they've never done before. And, uh, you know, sometimes uh, government employees kind of get a bad rap, you know, as not being, uh, you know, there either for the right reasons or maybe not working very hard. These people have been working seven days a week uh, for the last 12 months uh, trying to do this. So, you know, certainly it's, uh, you know, it, it's been quite an effort. And, uh, you know, the SBA historically has been one of the smallest federal agencies by headcount. So you're taking one of the smallest federal agencies with one of the smallest budgets, and you're basically just saying, you know, go and do this. And it's been, 
been very interesting to watch uh, uh, watch them react to this and watch them try to stand this up. But uh, you know, historically, you know, we're we're not used to this type of attention in this industry for Good. sure. Okay, Cassandra. Right, I just sent you um, an email that shows the slide that I with the businesses I mentioned, and I'm going to talk in a minute about the um, um, SBSC. Okay, I just responded actually. For some reason, oh. that link says I don't have access to the it file. Won't open. It won't yeah. open. So maybe if you could just save it as a PDF and send it. Okay, I'll do that. I love that. All right. Well, let me keep talking for a minute, then I'll do it. Okay. okay. Um, because I think there are some other things that SBA can look at. Um, in terms of uh, making the competition for loan funds a little more even. So certainly one of the things that's happened now, um, going back to the slide about um, bank branches is that there's been much more bank consolidation. Um, and because of bank consolidation um, and the availability, you can go back to that other slide, um, Brittany, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, because of bank consolidation, we have lot, lots more national banks that of course have, you know, huge lending departments um, as compared to small community banks that are not able to compete, you know, as much against the big well-known banks. Um, and so that also makes it um, difficult uh, in this, you know, rush to um, get the SBA loan funds. And so I think something ought to be done for community banks uh, so that more money is set aside for those small community banks that might have the relationships uh, with, the, with the businesses in their community. Um, and therefore be more likely to approve uh, loans for them. And those, and maybe some of those businesses are more like the ones that the SBA thought of as needing the guaranteed loan funds. Um, going back to the ma uh, map here that Brittany has up, it's just an example of um, what happens with um, banking uh, in a place like Baltimore. Uh, and the idea is that there are these places now called banking deserts. And so the hot pink balloons uh, represent uh, bank branches. Um, the orange are post office. This, was, this map was created in a time when the idea was that perhaps postal banking was a way to get more people into the banking market. And then the green, the lime green, are alternative financial lenders. And so basically the idea is that there are loads of alternative financial services providers, okay, but not a lot of regulated um, bank lenders, the hot pink. Uh, and in this, on this particular map, uh, the predominance of the hot pink uh, are in the urban parts of Baltimore, the downtown parts of Baltimore. And of course, the farther out you go, um, the less likely it is for uh, consumers to find a bank branch. So again, just to underscore the idea of, you know, access to banking services, um, difficult for emerging businesses, especially that may not have the relationships um, because perhaps a branch is not even in the neighborhood. Um, I think another thing uh, to think about, um, and this is, you know, uh, one of those grab and reach things, um, is to can perhaps- I, Cassandra, can I just ask mm -hmm. you a question again? Okay. Uh, can you just take a minute again on these alternative financial service oh. providers? Because I, you know, sitting here, I would never have guessed that there would be that many of them around. Can you talk, can you talk a okay. bit about yeah, let, let me talk about are? that. Yes, certainly. So we think about alternative financial services providers. We're thinking about basically um, a group of lenders um, who look and act like a bank, but which are not, who have no access to um, federal, federal funds that banks have um, and really just serve as uh, financial intermediaries without any of the benefits of being of having a bank account. Okay, so having a bank account means that um, one possibly, you know, can build credit, would have access to loans, um, and in that regard, are able to you're able to compete in the um, the formal banking economy. If instead you're going to a check casher to cash your check instead of to a bank, okay. Um, you don't have a relationship with the bank uh, because you're just getting, and you don't have a relationship with the check cashier because you're just getting cash and going back on a regular basis. Okay, you're not able, you're, probably, you're not able to save usually because there's no saving mechanism attached with them. And so when you need a loan, which everybody needs at some point in time, um, all you're able to do is to go to a predatory type operation like a title loan place or um, um, 
the cash, you know, cash outlets that do lending, which have very high interest rates. Now they're regulated by the states, um, but they are, but usually the interest rates uh, are the highest possible amount allowed. And so we're often into double digits, you know, at a time when uh, interest rates are, are really quite low. And um, if you know anything about payday loans, even though they, most states have done some type of regulation towards them, they are the kind of cycle that is very difficult for people to ever get out of. Um, and so not having a bank account uh, is basically a way of being financially excluded or not being able to compete in the mainstream you know, banking arena in the country. So these, so, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. So these green spots are like uh, ca check cashing agents. Check cashing places, auto auto loan places, uh, auto title title loan places, pawn shops. A lot of people use pawn shops. Boy. And the amount, of course, adds up. You know, both over the year and over a lifetime. It's about thirty thousand dollars over a lifetime of an employee. Um, so again, just the idea of, you know, how integral banking is to credit and formal banking is to credit um, and how that is a problem often uh, for emerging businesses. So again, another way to get money, I think, to, um, uh, to minority businesses uh, is to perhaps have some kind of certification in my minority business lending and some type of tax incentive for it. And I think if we paired that with, base, with again, allocating some money to small community banks, um, that perhaps we could um, begin to generate um, a pool of money that would be more readily available. And, you know, you know it's, not, it's not the case that when a um, business goes in and would perhaps be a good candidate for an SBA guaranteed loan, it's like, well, poof, the money's all gone. Okay, so Brittany, let me send you the, um, I'll send you the slide and let me start talking just a little bit about the SBIC. Uh, program and then Ethan, maybe you can add something to it, and I can pull the slide up for Brittany. So the SBIC program is a program that's also administered by um, uh, by the SBA, and the idea is that it is a capital um, uh, investment fund. It's you know it's, it's like a a VC fund. Okay, excuse uh, me but, just a minute, Cassandra. Um, it's about we. It's about oh. uh, seven uh, seven minutes to six. Uh, okay. Let's just plan to go. Let's not. We 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 can go over from six, and um, so let's just finish up your presentation. Let's not worry about closing it down right at six o'clock. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so the SBIC program is um, described as a public partner, public private partnership, um, because um, the SBIC um, again is an investment fund, and fund managers uh, create the application process and um, they leverage capital from private investors. And then this is money that is available uh, to uh, small businesses that qualify. And so this is the funding that I was talking about when I you know, threw out the big names uh, of companies uh, that have benefited from SBA funding um, because uh, they were able to get funding through uh, a small business investment uh, company. And Ethan, you want to tell them more about that, and then I will um, um, I will pull up the slide. Very few minority businesses um, have been able to um, get SBIC financing, and one of the um, what one of the objectives of the SBA recently has been to has been talking about how um, more minority and women-owned businesses uh, perhaps would be able to use um, this particular. Uh, Arm of the SBA. SBA. Yeah, um, uh, you know the the SBIC program, as you mentioned, uh, you know they, they're they're taking uh, they're taking private funds. They're getting a loan from the SBA, uh, you know, to to kind of augment those funds, and then they're doing uh, you know they're doing uh, equity plays uh, with companies. But you know th there aren't a lot of um, uh, you know, tight requirements in terms of uh, targeting those funds to underserved communities. Um, you know, and you know, and it's uh, again, you know, I, I think it is, uh, you know, kind of uh, in indicative of the fact that you know there, there's not a one size fits all uh, uh, solution 
uh, for small businesses in terms of what they need. But, uh, you know, Cassandra, to, to your point is that, you know, I think where SBA, you know, could do better, uh, you know, is by making a conscious effort to, uh, you know, target underserved businesses and provide incentives uh, to lenders to target uh, un underserved uh, markets, uh, you know, and not just by, you know, kind of providing this blanket uh, 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 program that's available to all, uh, you know, but may not be reaching uh, the people that need it the most because of the infrastructure things, because of the banking deserts, because of the, I mean, that, that map of Baltimore that you had uh, was, was something. And I mean, I, 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 I went to Johns Hopkins. So I, I, I recognize, like, I was like, I was like, look at, I'm like, whoa, wait exactly a minute. Hold on. Thought, right. I, I know, I know. Yeah. Right. I, I, you know, I know, uh, I know that map pretty well. And uh, um, you, you know, so, but I, I think that, you know, the, what the agency, you know, hopefully will do would be to maybe do some set asides for community banks, for CDFIs, you know, maybe make it easier for mission based lenders to participate mm -hmm. in the program. And, you know, they've got a bunch of these pilot programs, but the mm -hmm. problem is, is that you can't, you, you can't solve the problem with a pilot program. You need to kind of, you know, you need to get serious and go all in and say, hey, we're serious about this. We're going to go right at this problem and we're going to try to solve it. You know, I mean, they could do something where they increase the guarantee for minority owned businesses and say, hey, if you're doing a minority owned business, we're going to, you know, we're going to give you a 90% guarantee. You know, heck with this seventy-five percent stuff. I mean, you know, you know, you you see the SBA tinker around, you know, kind of the edges, and it kind of is reflective of what the priorities are of the administration that's currently in office. You know, back in uh, uh, the the second uh, Obama administration, there were all these incentives for export. And they wanted to, you know, export, export, export. So, you know, you had all these incentives for for lender for for businesses that were involved in exporting. Well, you know, if they can do it for exporters, if they can do it for international trade, if they can do it for veterans, if they can do it, they can do it. You know, they just, you know, there needs to be the political will to do it, you know, and there needs to be the vision to see, you know, how we can kind of pull the levers of power here to, uh, you know, to to make this program. Uh, 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 you know, do more to level the playing field. And I really think that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that, uh, you know, this administration will, you know, do more than pay uh, lip service to it and that they will actually uh, uh, use this power that they have right now to try and, uh, 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 you know, try and help these underserved communities. And then I think uh, again, synergy and friction, meaning that yeah. the um, SBA lending process and the and the bank regulatory process, you know, uh, need to yeah. intertwine in a way that's meaningful. Um, yep. And so, to the extent that the um, bank reg, the bank regs um, are discouraging certain types of loans, you know, they also need to ease up. And so, yeah. if again, these are um, if these are joint regulations. Um, yeah. then it's going to be, it's going to create a program that can really work. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's not only the, the, the banking regulators, but the SBA themselves, because, uh, you know, SBA lending, you know, and now I'm talking against my own uh, self-interest because the reason why my law firm and my practice exists is because SBA lending is not easy. Uh, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of my lender clients uh, are always very concerned that they're going to make a mistake and they're going to forget to dot right. that very right. important I or cross that T and uh, they're going to lose their guarantee. And so it makes them, you know, maybe a little more cautious than, you know, they might otherwise need to be. And if the SBA could maybe, you know, relax that a little bit, you know, and, you know, then it's always the friction because, you know, every time you, you talk about this, they're like, well, boy, we've got to protect the taxpayer. And you're like, wait a minute, I'm a taxpayer. Yes, let's protect the taxpayer because that's me. But I also think that, um, uh, you know, for, uh, you, you know, for these, you know, you know, for these credits and to get this capital into the hands of, of these businesses that need it and that don't have all the traditional 
uh, uh, avenues to access it. You know, that there, there, there should be some way to kind of say, you know, to zoom out, look at the entire picture, see the entire field and say, this is what this lender was trying to do. And we're not going to penalize them for it because we're not necessarily going to, uh, you know, look at it the same way. And I think that, you know, as somebody who, who does work with these lenders, you know, that, that's, that's one of the things that they're always concerned about. And if, if the SBA could find a way to take that concern away or at least ameliorate it, then I think that, uh, you know, and, and provide incentives and kind of get everything working in synchronicity here, then I think that it, it, it might have a greater impact. So Brittany's showing um, a picture here of the names of some of these companies that have benefited from SBA funds. Um, and most of these went through the SBIC uh, process, the small business investment um, uh, program that helps meet the capital needs of small businesses. So more like a, a, a VC fund uh, for small businesses that otherwise wouldn't be able to, to get money that way. By the way, in our class for the past two weeks, we spent uh, time on the the VC, two sessions on dealing with VC funding and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and in a business planning book, an excellent book. And and I, I think nowhere in the book do they talk about small business loans or the SBIC being mm -hmm. an example of, of a venture capital uh, effort. And banks are encouraged to participate in, in the SBICs because they get uh, community reinvestment fund credit. You know, banks have to uh, invest in their communities. Um, that's a result of the uh, anti-redlining uh, legislation uh, from the mid seventies and it was reinforced under the Clinton administration. Um, so banks can, you know, get, you know, credit for lending uh, incentives by participating in funds like this. So again, you know, how do we incentivize them to um, also push for more minority and women-owned businesses uh, being able to, to, you know, start small and grow like these? Could, could you turn to that slide that you had on the SBICs? I, I, thought, I found that to be very helpful. Can you take a minute and were you gonna talk about this slide? Oh, I can. Um, so again, SBIC is a privately owned company, but the SBA licenses them. And so uh, the SBA matches the funds um, two to one. So you go out and find private investors to participate um, as limited partners and invest funds who also um, get a tax incentive. And then the SBA, you know, also puts some money in. And so the SBIC develops, of course, its own um, means for determining um, who will qualify, you know, for for each SBA, I'm sorry, each SBIC does that. Um, um, it it uh, determines who will qualify uh, to participate in the, uh, the fund. And so it's an indirect investment uh, from the SBA, but it's a very important one, you know, um, because um, uh, these are private funds that are going along with, um, again, the guaranteed funding so, to so make capital are, more accessible. So mm -hmm. these are, this would be, equity funding and, and it could go along with a 7A loan to the business? Now, there, is there any prohibition against that? I don't know. We have to ask yeah, you, 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 you actually have to be, uh, you have to be careful uh, because while the mm -hmm. SBA does you know, use all of its programs, I mean, you see, it's all kind of a similar concept. We're gonna take these incentives to kind of leverage and magnify the, the impact that these dollars have. But one of the things that SBA uh, tends to restrict is they kind of say, well, look, you know, if you're leveraging dollar, you know, taxpayer dollars from this program, we're not going to let you double dip and leverage also leverage from this program. So a lot of times businesses kind of have to pick the direction that they want to go, because if, if you've been funded by an SBIC, you then can't go out and get a 7A loan, for instance. Uh, you know, that is a restriction that they have uh, in terms of, uh, how many times you're allowed to kind of leverage these dollars and they do, and the, they do set so limits. Yeah. I think the idea also is that by the time you're at the SBIC level, you know, you've grown your business enough, but you perhaps right. are stuck. You're not, you're not, maybe not be as competitive 
um, in the private uh, venture capital market, but your business has, you know, has benefited from perhaps the SBA guaranteed loan funds. Uh, right. And now you sort of need the next step to be able to get, you know, get into a larger market. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know uh, when I was, when I was back in law school a long, over 50 years ago, 50 years ago to be exact, um, there was something called the Minority Small Business Investment Company. Mm-hmm. Misbix, I think they were. Do mm-hmm. we still have Misbix? Yeah, uh, I don't think so. I haven't heard of them. I don't think so. But it sounds like it was an SB, an SBA, SPIC. I don't. Yeah, for I, minority I, I think it, I, my, my, you know, this was this was a long time ago, but. But I remember studying something about minority small business investment companies. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but and maybe it was something that they had back in the 60s, late 60s, early 70s, but did away with. But I mean, this just as a, from a policy perspective, this S, SBIC um, seems to me to be something that is an attractive uh, vehicle for uh, uh, for promoting the minority development, business development, because you're bringing you're bringing equity to the table and not just debt. Right. What we've been talking about with the 8A program and the 504 program are debt. And, and thanks for bringing that up, Sam, because that's the point I actually wanted to make earlier. Um, that you know we need more small businesses need more than debt. You know they need more than a debt structure. They've got to be able to find a way to. Um, expand and have access to equity and, and to be, you know, to not be so highly leveraged. Yeah. Okay. Cassandra, anything else? No. Ethan, anything else? Uh, not at this point, but uh, happy to answer, uh, happy to answer any questions. Anybody have questions? Okay, on behalf of our students, on behalf of Penn State Law School, on behalf of Sam Thompson, I want to say thanks to both of you guys for such a brilliant, uh, exciting, uh, challenging, and in some respects depressing <laughs> presentation. But it was it was so insightful, um, and uh, I want to thank you both for participating. And Cassandra, can we make sure we get your slides? Yes. I don't have your slides. Can you send me okay. your slides? And, okay. and I want to make sure that they, they are available to uh, to everyone. Okay. okay any, uh, Brittany, thanks to you for doing a great job. And thanks for you to be, for being a big lawyer. I mean, a good lawyer. Just, you know, the, the law professor asks you a question and you just go look up the law just like <laughs> that. That's pretty damn good. That's pretty impressive. Well, not to impress you again, but Ms. Bick, I looked them up and they yes. were... Minority Enterprise Small Business Investment Company. So you're close. You're forgetting the E, Professor Thompson. Okay. Mesbic. Um, and in the 1970s, the government initiated the Venture Capital Program, um, which began as an outgrowth of the previously established SBICs. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you. Will you send me that, Britain? Yeah. <laughs> I can do more research. Yeah, and would you yeah. send it to me too, please? <laughs> I can do too, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks to everyone. I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, good good evening. Um, uh, Sam, Sam, you said we would talk about the paper. Ah, uh, thank you. Oh. I was I, I almost forgot it. Uh, I'm gonna say goodbye to thank Ethan. You guys, please. Goodbye to Cassandra and okay. students. I'm gonna hang around. We're gonna talk about the paper. Thank you, Alexa. All right. We're keeping Thanks, me on Brittany. my toes. Thanks, Sam. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you. Okay. I have another presentation. Um, so my class started, it, it's at 610. So is it okay if I go to that? Yes. Okay, go ahead and go to your, go ahead and go, go ahead and go. Okay. You. And uh, you can, I'll send you a note or something on the. Okay. On the, All in the sky. But, the, but what I, what I sent out before is accurate. And I, I apologize for any kind of um, confusion. Uh, but we we're, we're just going to follow um, follow the the the, uh, the steps that were um, were um, were specified there. Okay, Alexis. Okay. Thank you. Good. Does that make sense?
So we're not having a draft due in two weeks. Let me pull Only it up. Hold, hold on, hold on. Let me pull it up. Um, I put the email in the chat, Sam, if you just want to look at that. It's the, okay. cool. I copy and paste it directly from the chat. Okay. Yeah, it was the prior email. Um, he had sent one out this weekend saying that. Okay, but no, it, um, the, 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 the original, let me just get to the original email that I sent. Okay, yeah, how do sent, I get there? Nicole sent the original in the chat. Alexis is referring to the email you sent this weekend with the new date. But if you're okay. looking for the original dates, they're in the chat. They're okay, now how do I get them? Help me with the chat. Okay. So it'll be on the bottom oh. panel next to share screen. If you click chat, it just shows Okay, you. okay. So Thursday, April 22nd, an outline. Yes. Friday, April 23rd, I will give you comments on your outline. Tuesday, presentation, 15 minutes. Thursday, May 13th, first draft of the paper. Friday, Sam's comments. Thursday, May 20th, final paper due at 5 p.m. Um, so those are the dates that I that I had uh, specified. The one thing is, I think I may have, did, did I move this May 30, May 20 date a little earlier? Or did I, or, or did I just keep it there because it's the last day of finals. Well, no, what you moved was the date for the draft. You moved the draft, the full draft to be due in two weeks. It, the, okay, it moved the full draft to be, okay, when you say it moved the full draft to be due in I two weeks. I don't want that, I'm just saying. Okay, okay, hold on a minute. When you say I moved the full draft to be two, due in two weeks, you're talking about in the second email, right? The yes. most recent email. Okay, that I, that was a mistake on my part. I I forgot about this, and in 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 and, and uh, I should have gone back and looked at my original email. This is what we're going to be doing. But I want to thank you for bringing it to my attention. Thank you. That's better. <laughs> okay. So, but what you'll be doing is your outline on the twenty second. I'll give you response. Give you a response. But I think we talked about maybe the papers being due a little sooner than May 20. Obviously, you can turn in the papers before then if you want. But we'll stick with this with this uh, with this uh, schedule. Great. I just wanted to also confirm that because you said on the call the other night that you needed a draft and you almost gave me a heart attack. So I'm glad that we're all on the same page that the draft is not due. Okay. To I apologize. I've got a lot on my plate and I made a mistake. And uh, but I but I I want to thank you, ladies, for keeping me keeping me in line. No worries, my stress level is to the ceiling as well. So I just wanted to kind of get that sorted out as soon as possible. Well, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, guys. Have a good. Hey, what did you think of that session today? Wasn't that excellent? Mm -hmm. Boy, hey. all of these all of these sessions have just been off the charts. Um. um Fascinating. Uh, okay, so we're on to next Tuesday. You got four and a half hours. Um, how many students are, are still on? Who's, who's still on? We've got four people here. Four people, okay. Let me, can I, can I, let me just take a minute and, and, and uh, run something by you. Now I originally told I told you that you you wouldn't have any assignment for the uh, class next week, and I'm I'm having a second thought, and this is the thought: to ask two of you to be prepared to ask questions for each session. So I would go through and assign um, two of you to each session to be to be, you know, to, 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 to look at at least the materials, assuming there are materials for the session, but in, 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 in red, be ready to sort of ask, submit questions for, uh, for the particular session. What do you think of that? Okay, let me say that uh, while, I at, while I was thinking about doing that and I talked with one of you about it, I don't need it because um, the way the questions are gonna be working, um, uh, we, 
you know, we could get questions from a lot of different places. So I'm not going to I'm not going to ask you guys to um, to do that. But except to say, I, I urge you to to be there for the full time. I urge you to listen carefully to the presentations to the extent you can look at the materials, at least glance through the materials. The materials will be ready, hopefully by Friday. And uh, ask questions if uh, if um, if if you uh, if you have a question, ask a question. Um, and I think it's going to be a great session. It's up on the it's up on the uh, Penn State website now. You can look at the material. Look at the at the uh, sessions. I don't have the materials up yet, uh, but uh, I think it's going to be a spectacular uh, spectacular program. Starting off with Leo Strine who used to be the Chief Justice of the Delaware Supreme Court uh, and is one of the smartest corporate lawyers in the country. Um, okay, I'm through talking. Does anybody wanna say anything or have a question for me? And Alexis, thanks for making sure that I, that I dealt with this this evening. I appreciate it. No other questions? Thank you so much, ladies. And have a uh, have a good evening. You as well. Okay. Bye bye.